This is Open Minds Radio. Here again, your host, UFO paranormal researcher and journalist, Alejandro Rojas. Hello and welcome, all of my friends out there in UFO hood. This is Alejandro Rojas, and you are listening to Open Minds Radio. I am going to be a little bit delirious, possibly. Because I just got back from a, well, not that long of a trip. It's just a short plane ride. A, a skip and a jump over to California because I was in the Bay Area in San Leandro, which is very similar to Alejandro. Beautiful area. I've never been to the Bay Area. While I was in San Jose, funny enough, the last time I was in the Bay Area, San Jose, I was kind of stuck in a hotel because it was for a MUFON symposium. And that very symposium was very related to our guest today, which is a wonderful guest, Leslie Keene, who's just been making all kinds of big news all over the place with her new book, UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. And uh, the reason the San Jose Convention for MUFON was related is because she helped us, and we had a lot of those international generals, pilots, uh, and everything at that symposium to speak. So it was awesome. It was a beautiful place. Uh, And (laughs) funny enough, I guess uh, the thing that I was at this weekend was to help run, uh, to get funds for MUFON in Northern California because they're still trying to pay off that event to be completely honest with you. It was very expensive. It was nice because there are so many international people. It was incredible uh, to see all these people like General De Bauer uh, from Belgium, who was the Air Force uh, guy who investigated uh, the Belgium Triangle Wave, which so many people are familiar with. It, an incredible case and a lot of incredible cases. We'll be talking about a lot of all of these cases with Leslie Keene. And uh, we also got to see James Fox out there at uh, this event because uh, he was showing a couple of his shows. Uh, This was kind of a film fest type of thing along with some speakers. And James Fox and Leslie Keene actually worked together to do this press conference in Washington, D.C., where they had originally got all these people together that she includes in her book. So that's when it all began. Then we uh, kind of... Uh, caught on to the tail end of that with MUFON and brought those people back. And then she got statements from all of these guys, put it into an incredible book, and then got that book out recently. And it has been a hit, a New York Times bestseller on UFOs and very credible, interesting stuff. Obviously, there are a lot of people interested in UFOs out there. And... You all know that because you're listening to a UFO radio show, so obviously you guys are really interested. So we have a great show tonight. I'm very excited about this show, Um, and I'm very excited about the event that we got to go to the UFO X-Fest, and we'll talk more about that a little later. A couple other things. We got to introduce our new magazine, which isn't even out yet, but some of those people and the Bay Area got a sneak peek and got to get copies of those. For you subscribers, we'll be mailing those out tomorrow uh, because they just got printed. And this one's about UFO landings, and it has more to do with uh, the Rendlesham Forest. Uh, all of that incident in detail is in this one, and which is really exciting. And those were things that were also in Leslie King's book. She had uh, Charles Halt, who was a deputy base commander to later become the base commander at the base, the Bent Waters base where this all took place, and James Penniston, who was the guy, we've had him on our show, an incredible show, I mean, his, he is a very credible person, um, you know, he's a very sober, careful person, the way he describes what he experienced that evening when he went and touched a craft in the forest. Uh, in that those days after Christmas in 1980. So really cool stuff in the magazine that you'll be getting very soon. Only we've seen it. You can call your buddies in the Bay Area. Say, hey, man, 
What's in that magazine? Did you get one? As you know, we have a new time and no commercials. Yay, there's so many people out there that are going, yes. They're in their cars like, all right, listening to their the podcast there. Everybody loves no commercials. And honestly, you know what? I hate commercials. I listen to public radio. I watch public television or I watch internet TV and stuff because I cannot stand commercials. I watch C-SPAN, all this C-SPAN because... They don't have commercials, thank goodness. I'm not a fan of commercials, so it is very cool that we don't have commercials. Now, we just have a couple little reminders about cool products that Open Minds has here and there to give ourselves a break so we can blow our noses or, or do anything else we have to do uh, and do that off camera to spare you the, the visual there. So, and we're an hour and a half. That means we're going to have a full hour plus with Leslie Keene. There are people out there giggling like little schoolgirls because they're just so excited about this interview. I know it. Also, the UFO Congress is getting more and more solidified, and we are having more and more people contact us. Like the whole world of ufology is begging. And I'm not even kidding when I say some of these people are really begging to speak at this conference because it's going to be so incredibly cool here in phoenix in late february so so you guys you know you think i'm exaggerating but i'm not you know you can ask jason you can you can call us up and be like you know hey maureen you know and i've mentioned her before was that alejandro guy exaggerating ask jason he'll tell you nope they are banging on the doors harassing us we're gonna have to get restraining orders on some of these people i'm afraid before it's all said and done because they just want to speak so bad. But we also have some people that are kind of surprises that we're kind of holding in our pocket here that we're probably going to be able to get. And unfortunately, I can't tell you who, but when you hear, you're just going to be, yet again, you're going to be giggling like little schoolgirls, and you're just going to be so excited. So I would recommend you get your tickets early. You can go to our website. You can go to openminds.tv or ufocongress.com and register right now. You can reserve your hotel room. Beautiful, beautiful hotel, uh, wonderful rooms to make sure you get a, a, a room in the hotel because they're probably gonna sell out pretty quick and if you don't get a room in the hotel, uh, you're gonna have to be down the street. And that's just not gonna be as fun. That'll still be a lot of fun. You'll just have to take a shuttle ride and you know, if someone calls you and says, oh man, you cannot believe what this dude's saying. You're going to have to jump on a shuttle to try to get over there. And it's just going to be easier if you stay at the hotel. So once we are done, uh, you're done listening to the show, go ahead and go register for your room and for the conference. All right? That's my advice for you. And, of course, on the website, as usual, and uh, now our news is sponsored on MUFON because really, and it maybe this is just my opinion, but I, I think, uh, you know, it probably is the most updated news feed where we give you all of the news uh, in the conventional media that's going on out there about UFOs. And UFOs are in the news like crazy. In fact, my talk in, uh, in uh, San Leandro about this was kind of focused on uh, some of this stuff, including China and how China all of a sudden is becoming UFO crazy. They're having all kinds of stuff in the news about uh, UFOs, and I'm sure Jason, our news correspondent, is going to tell us all about that. He's just, he looks really excited to give us some news. So, Jason, why don't you just go ahead and get in there and give us some UFO news, buddy? Greetings, Alejandro, and hello, world. This is your Open Minds News Brief for Monday, September 20th, 2010. A retired Air Force officer, Stanley A. Fulham recently wrote a book that predicts a massive UFO display above, above Earth's major cities on October 13th of this year. The author of this 352-page book believes that this will be the first interaction leading to humanity's acceptance of extraterrestrials, and with help from their technology, we will be able to remove the dangerous levels of carbon monoxide from Earth's atmosphere. Fulham's book, Challenge, Challenges of Change, draws on his military career in the Air Force and with NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, 
After announcing the exact date for this supposed extraterrestrial interaction, he safely clarifies that there are no absolutes and the extraterrestrials may postpone their visit. So he's playing it a little safe there. Yeah. After it's going out on a limb and saying, yeah. this date is when we're going to have this uh -huh. huge show. That's what others should do, hedge their bets. What's interesting, of course, is there's people saying this kind of stuff all the time, as we know. Um, and it's not like I'm thinking, you know, because he's saying it, it's going to happen any more than, you know, any of these other people that we've come across. But his background is what's so interesting. I mean, this real military background, he really worked at NORAD, and I know Antonio was looking it up also. Very interesting. And, you know, like our guest will mention tonight, we're seeing a lot more of that. These military mm -hmm. officials, government officials, actually coming out and discussing things based on their experience um, with the military, with the government. Hopefully that trend continues. Just months after a UFO shut down an airport in China, it happened again, but at a different airport in China. Reports state that a UFO hovered near the airport for an hour, causing incoming planes to be diverted to other airports as a safety precaution. And, as with the incident back in July at a different airport, no official explanation has been given. Yep. And, uh, well, and as we talked about before, it could be one of those Chinese billionaire guys who have those Lear jets that kind of just do whatever the heck they want. But uh, who knows? I mean, they're shutting down airports. Which means there's definitely something there. Mm -hmm. And hopefully somebody knows, but there's not telling anybody else. Hopefully we get some real pictures or video. And that's been the issue. There's been a lot of these claimed photos but they turn, up not, turn out to be something completely different, not associated with the incidents. You know what else is weird with this one is that it really hasn't made it over to American media. It was kind of a little and blip. And there's a possibility that it did, but after the last airport incident, and because of their own fault of getting their information from YouTube and not really doing their research, or just relying on open minds. We did the research for them. They right. could have just come to our website. Right. So that, that could explain why the U.S. media didn't pick up yeah. on it, because they kind of burned themselves last time. But Yeah. Maybe they felt embarrassed. We made them look bad. That's true. Sorry, well, guys. We're here to uh, report the news for real. For reals, yo. Staying uh, in China. There's been an increase in Hong Kong's UFO activity lately. On September 9th alone, there were five UFOs spotted. Wang Sichao, a planetary astronomer from the Purple Mountain Observatory, recently offered his explanation, stating that the UFOs were the result of ghost images from the reflection of the intense light emitted by outdoor circular lamps on the camera lens. It seems unlikely, though, that all of these UFOs, which were reported by several people, can be explained by ghost images from outdoor lamps. Mm -hmm. I know that does happen a lot. I mean, in you see a lot of UFO photos where that happens. There's a famous one in Washington, D.C. going around that uh, is supposed to be UFOs over the Capitol. And it's a cropped image. And if you see the uncropped one, there's these bright lights that you s can tell are completely mirrored above the Capitol. But like you said, it would be awfully coincidental that this happens five times in the Yeah, I mean, the here's day. the thing. People from, di you know, they weren't all five people sitting in a living room saying, oh, look, from the same vantage right. point, they were different reports from different yeah. areas and different cameras taking different pictures. Mm -hmm. Unless all of Hong Kong has these circular lamps everywhere. Yeah. I don't know. I've never been. Well, and then, but and all, all of them reporting that in one day, that doesn't really make sense. Right. So it's kind of strange. Mm -hmm. And I pointed it out before, I'm just going to point it out again, Kay. that the several sources that reported this story, again, cited the Purple, Mount, Purple, Purple Hills Observatory, when in fact it's the Purple Mountain Observatory. Yeah, lots of mistakes. As far as I know, there is no Purple Hills Observatory. Yep, so. careless reporting. Just thought I'd point that out. Yep. Let's get back to the U.S. here. A mysterious light display appeared in the southwest Florida sky last Tuesday night. Many coastal residents from Marco Island to Fort Myers Beach recorded the lights with their cell phone cameras and posted the videos to YouTube and Facebook. The lights were miles offshore and glimmered on and off for at least 20 minutes, according to witnesses. 
911 received several calls about the lights. A spokeswoman for the Homestead Air Reserve Base said Air Force jets were performing routine training exercises in the Gulf that night and the lights were merely flares dropped by aircraft. But multiple lifelong residents of the area say they have never seen anything in the sky like what they observed that night. Mm -hmm. And now are the pictures, were the pictures from the sighting too? They were. There, was actually, there were actually yeah. multiple videos of the sighting yeah. too, showing the lights in the sky and showing them appearing and yeah. going out and sort of changing shape. And they and didn't look like flares, right? Not real. I mean, flares can ha have that appearance, but right. the way they just like came on and went off and sort of, they didn't seem to be dropping or dropping consistently. You know, they seemed to move around. Mm -hmm. It's always possible there were flares, but these people didn't see any jets dropping the flares. Yeah. And these people living near this base see flares being dropped all the time. Mm -hmm. And this is the same story I had seeing the Phoenix Lights back in 1997. Yeah. Growing up very close to where flares were dropped all the time by A-10s, what I saw with the Phoenix Lights was not flares. Right. So, so I sympathize with these people. Exactly. You've been there and done that. That's right. Here's something from Arizona. A UFO was in the skies above Tucson last week. And similar to a sighting I reported last week about a UFO in China, where news reporters were able to record it with their cameras, the same happened in this situation. A photojournalist from the local ABC affiliate in Tucson saw the small blue object in the sky, so he set up his camera on a tripod and recorded it. They have no idea what the object was, but this isn't the first time that the channel has given airtime to UFOs. I don't know if you remember it, but when we were at the UFO Congress in February, Tucson also had a, a sighting that K-Gun, the channel in Tucson, reported on. And we did that in the news segment on that show. I remember that. I remember the sighting. That, this is an exciting one, too. I mean, hopefully, we probably should try to get a hold of these guys because this guy was, uh, he went out and got video. And you clearly see this little blue thing way up in the sky just sitting there. Right. It doesn't move. It's just there for a long period of time. He was obviously very shocked. They have great equipment there. Um, it must have been extremely high because it, it's just a small dot in this video. But how, I mean, that's a great video. It's incredible. And what the heck could that be? Right. I mean, there's nothing that does that. It's not a, a planet or a star. Um, this is midday. Um, this is one of those, I think, very well-documented sightings that um, hopefully can be and we should probably make a big deal out of. I think it, it's wonderful, too, that this guy did this. I think it's really cool. The guy was interested enough to set up his tripod, set up his camera, and just mm -hmm. shoot the sky. Yeah. And the video is actually on the K-Gun website. And uh, there are actually some photos uh, and blown up photos showing the guy, uh, showing the camera zoomed all the way in and showing mm -hmm. that just this tiny blue dot in the sky. And it's not yeah. moving. It's just hanging out. One of the reasons it, it excites me, too, is because this is something that's commonly reported, right. where people will see something like that, and uh, they'll say, hey, you know, and I've seen something like this, too. And uh, I had a buddy who, who did and uh, told me about it because he knew I was into this stuff, and he was all excited. He had a couple of incredible sightings. This one wasn't incredible, but he was at a party, and he saw something like this. And he's like, hey, check that out. What is that? What, you know, and everybody was looking up. Not everybody could see it because something like that gets hard to see. But uh, a lot of people did. And, you know, nobody knew what the heck was going on, what that was. Wow. Just something sitting still up in the sky. It happens a lot. Mm-hmm. But good for this guy for setting up his camera and getting it. It's yep. really cool. Here's an update to a sighting story from back in August. A UFO was reported in St. Paul, Minnesota in early August and was later found by police to be a kite with LED lights attached to it. The 34-year-old man who was flying the kite was arrested by officers on an unrelated outstanding warrant. The kite flyer served his time and was released last Sunday, but he went right back to his night kite flying. Police were alerted to the lights in the sky and they Im immediately knew what they were, LED lights attached to a kite. They found the kite flyer and cited him for disorderly conduct, public nuisance, and being in a playground after hours. And they even asked him, they said, hey dude, what are you doing? Are you just trying to screw with people? And he's all, yeah. I know, well, and I don't think they would have taken him to jail. There was a, one of the versions of the story I read, because at first I was thinking that would be fun to put some lights on a, 
on a kite, not to trick people, mm -hmm. but just to, because there was another video similar to that out a few weeks ago where it looked like there these LED lights around a balloon or something, and at night it looked really cool with these different shapes and stuff they were making, just that that would be fun. And uh, I was a little concerned, well, why would they send him to jail, you know, for that, or get him, yeah, why would he get in trouble for that? But they asked him, because they knew he had done this before, and like you said, they asked him, are you doing this? To fool with people, make them think they're seeing a UFO. Yeah, because that caused them, you know, lots of UFO calls, and the cops were busy answering calls, uh, 911 calls about UFOs and stuff. So if he would have said no, I'm just flying my LED kite, they probably would have left him. Uh, just told them, well, right. And it, it sounded like the officers were just frustrated with him and yeah. frustrated with dealing with the whole situation because they said yeah. it was, you know, a, a waste of valuable resources. Yeah. But otherwise, people, be a little careful. You know what? And this is one of the things that kind of frustrates me with people. If you think you're seeing a UFO, that's an extraordinary thing. It's worth getting on your bike or walking down the street or getting in your car and checking out. Because, uh, you know, that, that something similar like this has happened to me, and I do— I, you know, rerouted and drove over by, and I found it was not what I thought it was. I can't remember the exact situation. Maybe it was a helicopter or something. But, you know, do at least a little bit of investigating, and uh, you'll be able to see that it's a kite because, really, people should be able to be, be – and I think we're going to have more of this. Kites with LEDs. Everything has LEDs. Everything now that has they're LEDs. They're small, yeah. and it just takes a little computer to be able to do really cool things with all of these LEDs. We're going to see a lot more of these. I know there's airplanes, remote control airplanes that you can get LEDs on and stuff like that, too. Right. They have um, these hovercraft and helicopters and yeah. things that have these whole LED kits yeah. that come with them. Right. So you can fly them around at night for yep. fun, and that would be cool. So, uh, But then you get a lot of false UFO reports. So at least, you know, do a little bit of investigating. It's kind of fun. You'll feel like, you know, your Fox Mulder or your Scully out there on the hunt for a UFO. It definitely pays to, to do a little little investigation. Yeah. It's easy to do, especially if something is that close to you. Yep. You can sort of do some scouting around to eliminate yeah. possibilities anyway. And a lot of people get scared, but you're probably going to find out, you know, it'll alleviate your fear that it wasn't what you thought it was anyway. Yeah. So. In other news, Mark Pilkington, a British journalist and filmmaker, claims in his new book that the U.S. military has been responsible for seeding stories about UFOs to the public for the purpose of concealing secret military projects. In Mirage Men, An Adventure into Paranoia, Espionage, Psychological Warfare, and UFOs, Pilkington puts forth the claim that UFO stories have been used as a pretense for the flight testing of experimental and or secret aircraft. In an interview with U.S. News and World Report, Pilkington explains, just about everything that is popularly believed about UFOs has been exploited, shaped, and at times generated by people working for the U.S. Air Force and the intelligence community. He also acknowledges that through pop culture and paranoia, UFO stories tend to generate themselves thanks to the initial seeding by the military. Yeah, you know, I think uh, it's an interesting concept. I think that, uh, you know, this is something James Carrion has gotten really into, that... Uh, UFOs was kind of conjured up by the U.S. Air Force to uh, trick the Russians, um, stuff like this. And maybe that is the case for some of this stuff. I mean, I think both could exist because things are so compartmentalized that there are probably CIA, Air Force disinformation agents or counterintelligence that don't even know UFOs are real, but they decide, hey, I'm going to use this to, to trick the Russians or trick so-and-so. And, and possibly it could be used for that purpose, um, uh, at the same time, though, it doesn't answer everything because it doesn't answer all of these physical, uh, the physical part of the phenomena going on and the history of it going on. And in fact, because these stories come up, I want to ask Leslie Keen about it and see what she, her thoughts are. Well, unfortunately, in situations like that, that's where a lot of the paranoia and conspiracy start filling the voids there and fabricating things to, that seem to make sense. And yeah coming up with their own theories, but. Yeah, and that happens as well. It's a difficult field. Yeah. It's like, uh, actually, um, something I read recently, uh, talking about how UFOs, do, you know, there's a lot of, of noise versus the uh, sound. You know, the, the sound gets clearer, but there's a lot of noise. Th 
things that make static, like I'm hearing in my headphones, Jason, could you fix that? No, <laughs> but like a lot of static that kind of muddies the water. Um, assumption uh, around some of these conspiracies and possible activities by the Air Force. But I don't think they're going to tell us anytime soon. Well, maybe if we ask nicely. I haven't tried. Yeah, I don't think that'll work either. All right. And finally, multiple witnesses saw a gray colored UFO hovering 5,000 feet above Nevada's Sand Mountain last week, according to an anonymous email sent to Las Vegas based Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies. Bigelow Aerospace is a scientific research organization researching multiple parameters of advanced aerospace technology, emphasizing cutting edge and futuristic aerospace projects. This is the same organization that currently has their expandable space habitation module in orbit around the Earth and has a goal of putting a hotel in space. Bigelow Aerospace is trying to locate witnesses to the Sand Mountain UFO sighting. The organization even has its own unidentified aerial phenomenon reporting hotline. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, they've been uh, taking sightings from the FAA. And Bigelow Aerospace, uh, one thing that I think people... Um, kind of give them a hard time, but I think this is really cool that they're doing a little public outreach and uh, letting people know about something, some of the stuff they're working on and asking about this sighting because uh, I think it's incredible. And uh, it's one of the difficult things talking about the conspiracies that go on. All of a sudden we have this aerospace company, this um, self-made millionaire who gets involved with UFO research and people attack him. You know, you should do this. You should do that. Why are you doing things this way? Why are you doing things that way? When, you know, thank goodness we have this going on and we have someone helping us to discover stuff. And online right now, actually, you can find some of their uh, papers that they've written analyzing some things like black triangles, um, dulce. Uh, you know, in each case, in the triangle case, they, they found that um, the technology being exhibited is just too far advanced to be anything man-made. Uh, however, on the Dulce side, uh, they did a thorough investigation of the uh, the Mesa there, and they didn't find anything, no vents, and, and they thought there's no way there could be a base under here. So, But at least they're thoroughly doing research, and uh, I think we need to be appreciative of that. And I, I think it's really cool what Bigelow Aerospace is doing. I know Calm, uh, they've done some great work, and the Utah Ranch stuff is amazing. I mean, people love that stuff. George Knapp uh, is the one who helped write the book to get that out, but they've done some great work, and it's really cool to, to know that this aerospace company has kind of like this sci-fi or this X-Files uh, department. They've done a lot, they're doing a lot, and they have spent so much money researching mm -hmm. this phenomenon. It's crazy. And I'm not just kissing up because I want a ride to their space hotel. Though it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Please give go. me a ride. <laughs> That's it for the out. news. Remember to check out these stories and more at openminds.tv, your source for UFO-related news. I'm your Open Minds news correspondent, Jason McClellan, and you've been briefed. Thank you, Jason. And before we end this segment and get Leslie Keene on, and I've got her book right here. Let me uh, get my view of the camera to see if I'm – there we go. There, now it's in camera. There's her book, UFOs. Generals, pilots, government officials on the record. I'm going to put it right here. And before we go to break and, and give her a call and get her on the line, I did also want to mention Dan Dillman and Ruben Uriarte. They were the guys who put on the UFO X Fest that we were at this weekend. I want to thank them. They're awesome. They did a great job. The location, the ball theater, which is owned by Dan Dillman, is just an awesome place. If you're in the San Francisco area, check it out. Um, check out everything they've got going on there. He's going to do more of these UFO X-Fest, too. And then Ruben Uriarte, who runs the Northern California MUFON. Thank you. You're awesome. He's always doing a great job. And we'll talk a little bit more about him because he's the one who put on this wonderful San Jose MUFON symposium that mirrored Leslie Keene's uh, press conference in Washington, D.C. that also spawned the wonderful book she's getting so much press for. So let's go ahead and take a break. Let's get her on the line, and we will talk more about this amazing book. Stay tuned. You're listening to Open Minds Radio.
Open Minds Production is proud to present the 20th anniversary of the International UFO Congress, coming to its new home at the Radisson Fort McDowell Resort and Casino in Scottsdale, Arizona. This is the premier annual event for UFO researchers, enthusiasts, and the general public with an interest in mysterious phenomena. Come listen to expert ufologists, government officials, and respected scientists presenting information relating to UFOs, extraterrestrials, crop circles, abductions, cover-ups, and more at the largest UFO conference in the country. The 20th anniversary of the International UFO Congress takes place February 23rd through February 27th. Visit UFOcongress.com for more information, including sponsorship and vendor opportunities. Having been referred to as the CNN of UFOs, OpenMinds.tv is the hub for news relating to the alien UFO phenomenon. With daily updates of exclusive photos, videos, merchandise, and investigations, OpenMinds.tv is bringing UFO and extraterrestrial research to a global audience. The website features the Open Minds store stocked with books, DVDs, and other merchandise, including Open Minds magazine. Visit OpenMinds.tv, the definitive source for UFO-related news. That's www.openminds.tv. Are you or someone you know looking for the latest movies and publications containing information about UFOs and extraterrestrials? The Open Minds store is stocked with books, DVDs, and other merchandise, including Open Minds Magazine, the leading bi-monthly magazine that explores the UFO phenomenon. Single issues, as well as yearly subscriptions of Open Minds Magazine, are available in the store for both domestic and international customers. The recently expanded DVD offerings include dozens of documentaries and conference presentations by experts in the field of ufology. The ever-expanding line of products, including DVDs, books, and branded Open Minds merchandise, make the Open Minds store an online destination worth visiting frequently. Browse the store today at store.openminds.tv to see the latest editions. Welcome back to Open Minds Radio. Here now, former official spokesperson for the Mutual UFO Network, your host of Open Minds Radio, Alejandro Rojas. Hello and welcome. This is Alejandro Rojas, and you're listening to Open Minds Radio. And I am very happy to say that we have Leslie Keene on the line. Leslie, are you there? I am. Great to be with you, Alejandro. Great to be with you, Um I am just so excited about, first of all, I've always been excited about what you did because, you know, I've been able to watch the evolution from the press conference to to the book, but I'm so excited that you're getting so much press. Has that shocked you at all? Well, I mean, on one level, you know, it has. On another level, it doesn't shock me. It's sort of funny because... Um, now, on the one hand, I feel like the information that's in that book is so extraordinary and so compelling that I wouldn't, I'm actually not surprised that there'd be a strong reaction to it, mm-hmm. given, you know, what I think about it. And, um, but again, on the other hand, the flip side of that is the UFO subject is usually not treated that way in the media. So on, that, on another level, I'm surprised. So it's kind of both at the same time, to tell you the truth. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, uh, what I one of the things that really excites me, too, about what you've done is when I was doing the PR for MUFON, um, and one of the things which you helped me out with with that symposium was I think that this is the right way to do it. I think, you know, what you've done is by staying conservative and credible, sticking with the most credible information, it isn't covered as often by the media, but when it is, it's a big hit. Yeah, I think it's true, and I think it's not only that the information is so credible, but the fact that it's actually presented directly by these very high-level sources who have written their own pieces. Right. So it's, it really gives it a kind of an extra level of power, including, you know, five generals and a former governor. Right. I mean, uh, you're hearing it directly from them, so it's not just sort of me reporting on what they had to say. You're getting it firsthand, and I think that's uh, that's part of the power of the book. You're right, yeah. It's one thing to be able to tell people that this is what a governor or this is what a general said, but to have it in their own words, not only that, it shows that they are willing uh, and at least uh, that they're, I think, even actually changing the environment, that right now there is a kind of, uh, the environment exists where people can come out and talk about this stuff. I hope 
think you're right. I mean, I hope this will encourage others to do it. And, you know, we have five generals in the book, but none of them are American generals. And although there have been American generals who have talked off the record, um, you know, I'm hoping that this will encourage some other officials to do the same. Yeah, and, yeah, like you said, especially on the American side, uh, although I think it is kind of exciting, and even though these guys have been out and talking about it for a while, uh, on the American side, I think it is significant, and it hasn't got the attention, uh, at least some of it, that it should have, um, such as the Rendlesham side. People like um, Charles Halt and, and James Penniston um, haven't gotten the attention they should have. Luckily, Fife Symington, a, a governor of Arizona, did get quite a lot of media. Yeah, I mean, I think the Rendlesham Forest case, of course, is has been well-researched, and it's been written about. There have been whole books written about it, and I'm sure a lot of UFO people know a fair amount about that case. But I think what's really special about the way it's presented here is that, again, that Colonel Holt and, and Sergeant Penniston have actually written their own pieces in their own words, and this is the first time that they have come out in the level of detail that they're presenting here in the book, and I think also with the level of emotion. I mean, I think uh, particularly Penniston, who was so uh, intensely affected by what happened to him that he was really willing to, I think, expose his sensitivity in this chapter that he wrote um, in a way that he's never done before. So I think everybody can learn, even people that know the cases, can learn a lot from not only additional factual information, but also just the fact that they're getting this personal, uh, you know, first-person account written by the people themselves. It, it just sheds a new light on both the people and the case, I, I, I think. Yeah, I so. think that's one of the great things about some of these uh, first-hand witness accounts is that, uh, first of all, they're very credible people, which I think opens up people to hear what they have to say. And then, kind of like you said, you can hear y or you can read in there the emotion and the reactions and how they deal with this like a real person would, you know, the, um, the shock or the awe of the experience um, that they had. I agree with you. I mean, it's and the fear even. I mean, you know, again, a lot of these people are not used to talking so much about their emotional responses such as fear. I mean, you've got these tough, Air Force fighter pilots, you know, that's not what they usually want to express, but I, I, one of my jobs as sort of the, you know, the person putting this book together and helping these people get their pieces together was to encourage them to be as personal as they could, to be as detailed as they could about their actual responses in the moment while these things were happening, and I think, you know, I really encouraged them and coaxed them to do that, and I think it just makes their accounts so much more compelling. I mean, everybody wants to know, what did it feel like to be that close? What did it feel like to touch a UFO? You know, or what were you feeling when you, tr when you shot at one as a pilot? It's right. not just about what they did, but it's so curious. You, you know, we're all curious to know what their immediate experience was and what kind of feelings they had. So, yeah, I think I, I worked hard to encourage them to bring that forward because they're not used to doing that, most of them. Well, and luckily they're not in their jobs anymore because, of course, in our society it's uh, hard for men to, um, especially in the military, kind of relate their, their emotions anyway. Yeah, and most of them are not. Well, you're right. Most of them are retired. But one of our writers was, is actually a, a young man in his 30s who is an aviation captain in Chile who actually was one of the speakers at the 2007 press conference that I organized for James Fox in, in Washington. And he, he, um, you know, he, he, I was just thrilled to have him participate because he's mm -hmm. not retired. He's still an active captain, and uh, he's a young guy. You know, most of the people in this book are older and retired, but not all of them. So uh, he's one of, the, one of the exceptions to that. His name is um, Captain Rodrigo Bravo Garrido, and he's from Chile. Yeah, I remember his account. Um, it's... Uh Pretty extraordinary. Yeah, it's extraordinary that he's been able to get the permission also. I mean, his, you know, again, one of the things this book highlights is the difference between the, the way the subject is treated in other countries as compared to our own country. And mm -hmm. I think the Chilean situation is an example of that, where here this, this young captain was actually assigned 
uh, the UAP subject, as he calls it, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. He was assigned to research these cases when he, as sort of his um, thesis, for joining, you know, for part of his training, and they, they turned over the files to him, and they wanted him to, to look at the cases and write a report about it. That's how he got started in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, to imagine that he was assigned that and then has been completely uh, free to talk about it, to visit America. I mean, he had to get permission for all these things, but the bottom line is he got permission to do it, to come and talk about it, and to, he's also continued uh, investigating these cases, and he works closely with the... Uh, official government agency there, headed by General Bermudez. Um, so, you know, they, the country there is, is involved and responsible, and they're willing to allow their uh, employees and their directors of their agencies to discuss this, and I think that's really commendable. Right. Let's get into, um, we'll get more into some of the details on the book, but I want to go back also to um, how you kind of got here. Where was it? Uh, that as as a journalist, you know, working for a lot of the major media sources out there or, or writing for them, when was it that you took this issue seriously? Well, um, it was actually in 1999, a number of years ago, and you're right, I was working for KPFA Radio, which is a Pacifica network in Berkeley, California, and I was co-producing and co-hosting, on-air hosting a daily investigative news program on that radio station. And I also had done a lot of freelance publishing as well, um, stories on various topics in a lot of newspapers around the country and overseas. So I did have a bit of a publishing track record at the time, as well as radio experience. And what changed it all for me was when I received the Cometa report in the mail from a colleague in France, and um, this was a, probably most of your listeners know, but for those that don't, this was a um, military study that was uh, undertaken in France by a group of retired officials, including four generals, among them a four-star general, an admiral, and the former head of the National Space Agency in France, a former chief of police, and a number of other scientists and um, engineers and a government the official had been heading up the government agency for many years. It was a very impressive group of people. And these guys took a, did a three-year study of official UFO data on, on some of the best cases, interviewed many pilots, wrote up a report about it. And I was fascinated by the case reports as a journalist, but I was especially impressed by the conclusion that they came up with in this report, which was that the extraterrestrial hypothesis was the most rational and most valid and most likely even explanation for the cases that these gentlemen studied, which are, again, Mm -hmm. among the best cases, among that 5% of cases that that really have great data, but we cannot explain them. So anyway, as a journalist, just to, to end the story, you know, I was just covering all these normal stories, and when this thing hit my desk, I sort of felt like, you know, wow, this is like really a big deal, that people at that level would make a statement like that, that that they believed, you know, that these things were very likely extraterrestrial vehicles. And I I just thought, my God, this is a huge story. And I got very interested in it and um, wrote my first story in the year 2000 for the Boston Globe. And it it started, it was about the Cometa report that I, I wrote the story and did a bunch of research, which also went into the story. And um, from then on, I've been really fascinated by it and working at it pretty exclusively. But that's sort of how I got started. It was not something I expected would ever happen. Mm-hmm. It was just because of receiving this, this advanced English translation before anybody else of mm-hmm. this uh, amazing study out of France, and that changed everything for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's one. I've, we had Antonio Huneas on, who's, of course, my colleague here at uh, the magazine, so we've written a lot about <coughs> France and Cometa online and uh, in the magazine. But uh, one thing, you know, that we kind of agree on is a lot of people talk about a lot of countries coming forward uh, about UFOs and releasing files, but really there's no country out there that is truly investing investigation an official investigation and open in this subject like France. Yeah, I think France definitely gets the gold medal, as I've mm-hmm. said before, uh, for a government agency. I mean, there are other countries that have government agencies, but I, I think you're absolutely right. France is, is really the model for the world. 
part of it, I think, is because their agency is situated within their National Space Study Center, which is the equivalent of our NASA. So basically what that means is it's a purely research-based organization. You know, the, they're doing the work because they want to research a mysterious phenomenon, and it's more scientifically based. Whereas in a lot of other countries, the agencies are either civil aviation or Air Force or military based, and so they have a kind of a different thrust to them. But I think the sort of pure research aspect of the French agencies, again, the more scientific approach has really aided that situation. And they've been doing this since the mid 70s, and they're still going right. at it with, you know, at least two staff, you know, a number of people working at it, and they have a, a very well set up network of people around the country that assist them with, you know, laboratory studies and police are all plugged into it. And right. I mean, I went over there and talked to the people a couple of years ago who run it, and it was just very, very impressive how they've got this whole network and they meet regularly. And, um, you know, they have collected a lot of fantastic data on, on cases and handled them very, um, very scientifically. So I agree with you. I think um, they really, you know, a lot of, we can all learn a lot from, observing the way they've approached this. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you know, the 3A is an organization over there that recently came out with a report that reiterated uh, what you had mentioned earlier, is that the extraterrestrial hypothesis is still a possible um, cause for, for these UFOs. And I know it's something that um, you usually don't focus on, uh, but it is... Um, like I tell people, it's it's a fair hypothesis. Absolutely, it's a rational hypothesis. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and it certainly fits the data. I mean, when we look at the data that we have on UFOs, we all have to ask ourselves, well, okay, if they're not man-made and they're not na any kind of natural phenomenon, and we certainly know in many cases they are not secret aircraft that are being tested or some kind of human technology that's being tested. You know, then what are they? And um, we all ask that question, and so do the officials, so do the generals that, mm -hmm. that study this. And, I mean, it, you know, given what we know about the universe and the way the physical world works, it seems like, you know, logically we're all going to, our best guess is going to be that these are extraterrestrial things from somewhere else. Um, and it's, it's an extremely logical and rational deduction to make, so, um, and that's what, these high-level officials agree on. They just also agree that we don't know 100% for sure, that we haven't proved that to the satisfaction of the scientific community. And that certainly needs to happen, and that's, that's one of the things that the people who have come out of my book are all asking for, that, mm -hmm. you know, that we, we, our government participate in a much higher-level scientific investigation than it has ever happened before, and that we sort of decide to become more proactive and try to get the scientific data that we need to really determine what they are, one, you know, definitively. Right. And, um, but that's the only thing that's sort of missing. But, yeah, there's the, the extraterrestrial hypothesis certainly seems like an extremely rational one, and I would agree with that. So and that's what my sources have said, too. Yeah. Yeah. I, but moving, I guess, uh, to kind of move along the timeline with Cometa, another thing, because you know, I think, you know, a lot of, of this stuff is, and, and I think others do too, a lot of what you've done since you've gotten involved are really important and, uh, you know, d monumental things that you've been able to accomplish in this field. And one of those uh, that came eventually is your being able to work with John Podesta, um, who is, for those of who don't know, I'm sure they do, I talk about it a lot, he's a... Uh, you know, what's Clinton's chief of staff, and he helped with the transition for Obama and Biden into the White House. But you were involved with a press conference in the sci-fi where I think he made an incredible statement where he talked about uh, releasing the documents being the, the right thing to do and, and being the law. Yeah, I love that statement. I know it's been quoted a lot, and mm -hmm. I you know, the truth, and also the people can handle the truth, he said. Right. Um, and he said something very similar to that in the foreword to the book, and I, I just want people to know that he is the man that wrote the foreword to, to the book, which is called, by the way, UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been very happy that he 
that began, as you said, back in the early days of the Coalition for Freedom of Information when the Sci-Fi Channel had kind of gotten this whole thing going, this, this Freedom of Information Act initiative that I became involved with. In, I think it started in 2002, and John Podesta, that, that famous quote that he made was at a press conference that C at the CFI organized in cooperation with the Sci-Fi Channel, and he's just been willing to be kind of a public supporter of this work that we've all been doing, this group that I'm involved with, um, which because he's very much an advocate for government openness and believes that people can handle the truth and people have the right to the truth about everything, about mm -hmm. all the topics. But he happens to be curious and interested in the UFO subject, so um, he has been, um, you know, very courageous and, and um, I think, to just be open, publicly open about his support for it. Right. And when did that relationship begin? How did he get involved with that initiative? Well, back in 2002, when, when I started working, and Larry Lansman from the Sci-Fi Channel launched this initiative and invited me to kind of spearhead it as a journalist, we also had, we had a team of professionals that were involved with this, and one of them was the public relations firm that was run by John Podesta's brother, Anthony Podesta. And um, it was called Podesta Mattoon at the time. I think now it's called the Podesta Group. But um, because of the connection, we were actually working with one of the representatives from that public relations firm was on our team and was part of our working with us to, on the effort that we were involved in, which was which partly involved a public relations aspect because we were giving press conferences and trying to get the media interested in it. Mm -hmm. And so um, because of that relationship we had with Anthony Podesta's firm, um, his brother John was, was um, you know, sort of because he was his brother and we knew that he was interested in the UFO subject, he was just invited to participate and was willing to do it. So that's how the whole thing started, and he's just sort of maintained, you know, once I got involved in the lawsuit against NASA, which took many years, he was curious to see how that would unfold, and, you know, I was keeping him informed about what was happening. So um, he's just, you know, been kind of a, a curious and supportive person throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. That's how it all got started. So then the next press conference that came along went from, from some five years later, which I'm sure took a lot of work, is the big one uh, that you put together with uh, a lot of the uh, people who are in your book. Right. There was actually two press conferences we did initially uh, were around okay. this with, with, yeah, with John Podesta at the beginning. That's a minor point. It was, there was one in 2002 one in 2003. Oh, okay. You're right. And then, then in 2007, I co-organized this one with James Fox that you referred to, which was a very different kind of thing. I mean, this right. was a, yeah, a panel of, of top you know, officials from around the world. The earlier ones were specific to our Hexburg UFO Freedom of Information Act initiative. So the one with James was a much more high-profile, um, you know, all-encompassing kind of event in which we brought these people in to each of them to sort of present their particular, um, whether it be their history as an investigator, as an official investigator, someone like Nick Pope, for instance, or somebody, or whether they were actual witnesses to the event, such as uh, Captain, I mean, um, General Parviz Jafari, who was actually a witness. So we had a combination of high-level witnesses and high-level government investigators at this in this panel in 2007, and um, it got a lot of media coverage. And we that was when we sort of launched this government effort that expanded into the book, this effort to try to change government policy. Mm -hmm. So it was at that event that I actually met for the first time a number of the people who did end up writing for this book, and I w it was really great to have the opportunity to meet them and spend a few days with these incredible people. And it was also, for, for a lot of them, the first time they m got to meet each other. Mm -hmm. So it was a very profitable venture because people from a, a different corners of the globe were able to come together and talk, you know, these people that have all had these very similar experiences but have never met so um, right. that was important too but it was it was a very um i thought a very successful event were you surprised that you were able to get so many um of these guys to to come here and talk especially because they're from all over the world with uh you know th these diverse backgrounds even a general from iran right yeah that was general jafar you know that was the hardest he was the hardest one to get 
not because he didn't want to come. He wanted to come, but getting the visa for him mm-hmm. was really complicated, and it was expensive, too, but complicated. It took months for him to just get the paperwork together. He had to leave Iran and go somewhere in another, another country to go see some embassy there, and then, he, you know, it was this whole complicated, lengthy process. Um, and he was finally able to get the visa, but, he, yeah, so there was a lot of work involved in just the logistics of getting them here. But I think that, you know, they really, um, they were willing to come, and I think a lot of the reason was because we were very careful to prevent, present a platform for them in which, um, you know, nothing was going to be overstated, no claims of extraterrestrial contact or the kinds of things that these kinds of officials might be uncomfortable with. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody claiming that they understood what the UFOs were or anything kind of um, exaggerated, you know, it was all very carefully put together in in a, in the kind of way that they, as officials, felt represented their particular position, and they were comfortable with sort of the framework in which they were being asked to participate, and um, I think that's why they were re- really willing to, to yep. do it. Which I think is one of the brilliant things about what you guys put together, um, and the way that you and uh, James Fox go about this field. I'm sure they felt uh, they were in great company. I mean, they were with colleagues from around the world that were also very uh, credible. Yeah, it was a great opportunity for them to meet each other, Mm -hmm. absolutely, and to meet with me and James and to make the points that they wanted to make. I mean, these are men who have such close contact with this situation, this UFO phenomenon, whether it be both through witnessing it or investigating it, they care a lot about it, and their lives have been changed by what by their involvement, and they are, they are all people that, you know, if they, if they can speak about it in the, in the context that works for them, they are motivated to do it because of the impact this has had on them. So these were all people that were, I think, grateful and, and um, willing to speak about it when given the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And one of um, the things that I thought was impressive, or one of the people uh, well, they were all very impressive, but uh, when we did the MUFON Symposium with your help and, and got a lot of these guys uh, to the symposium, I particularly uh, really um, was surprised by General De Brower because I was excited to see his talk, and he had put together, he had an entire PowerPoint that later I asked him, and he had put it together himself. It was very impressive, and I mean, he had a whole talk, just, he was so open um, with no hesitation, um, so open to talk about all of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, I thought his presentation was just really great. Mm-hmm. I have to agree with you. And, you know, at the press conference, he only gave, he could only talk for five minutes. Yeah. But when he went to the MUFON conference, which was the next summer, so this was even less than a year, it was the summer of 2008, I remember very well, he was able to give a full-length presentation, and that was really what he most wanted to do. I remember when we brought him into Washington, he had a very hard time accepting the fact, because I was communicating with him on email to get him here and everything. He, he had a hard time accepting the fact that he could only talk for like four or five minutes. Mm. He really wanted more time, and he did. He put together a, a fabulous presentation with lots of, as you said, PowerPoint, written PowerPoints, but also great drawings and right. photographs and all kinds of... Um, interesting stuff and he's extremely accurate he's a very um meticulous very carefully meticulous mm-hmm. person you know who who's very careful about being accurate with every single i mean you you wouldn't believe the editing that he did on his chapter for the book you know, <laughs> he wrote a fantastic chapter for the book and he's so careful and so uh, just absolutely meticulous about it so that's the kind of talk he gave and yes He's very open. Mm-hmm. He's very willing to share everything that happened to him when he was w- working on this Belgium wave in 1989 and 1990 and all the things that went on and what his thoughts are about it. And he's a man who cares a great deal about solving this mystery and cares a, a great deal about it being taken seriously. And he's he's really um, stands behind that. Yeah, uh, he did a great presentation. He's also written a com- very compelling chapter for mm-hmm. the book too. Yeah, he's so, a uh, very approachable, nice person too. Just a, he, he was a really great guy. I remember how wonderful it was mm-hmm. to have him there. Yep. Well, yeah. Well, we're gonna take just a short little break, just a couple minutes, um, so we can uh, t- just kind of. 
do what we have to do for a minute, okay. and we'll be right back. You're listening to Open Minds Radio, and we will be right back with Leslie Keene, the author of UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record, a New York Times bestseller. Stay tuned. Open Minds Magazine, the exciting new publication by Open Minds Production, is in stores now. Open Minds Magazine is your look inside the fascinating world of UFO-related phenomena, including extraterrestrials, abductions, cattle mutilations, crop circles, alien implants, and more. Open Minds Magazine provides readers with current research, investigations, and news, all delivered in a stunning graphical presentation. Pick up your copy today and prepare to have your mind open. That's Open Minds Magazine, available now at Barnes & Noble, Borders, and online at openminds.tv. Having been referred to as the CNN of UFOs, OpenMinds.tv is the hub for news relating to the alien UFO phenomenon. With daily updates of exclusive photos, videos, merchandise, and investigations, OpenMinds.tv is bringing UFO and extraterrestrial research to a global audience. The website features the Open Minds store stocked with books, DVDs, and other merchandise, including Open Minds magazine. Visit OpenMinds.tv, the definitive source for UFO-related news. That's www.OpenMinds.tv. Open Minds Production is proud to present the 20th anniversary of the International UFO Congress coming to its new home at the Radisson Fort McDowell Resort and Casino in Scottsdale, Arizona. This is the premier annual event for UFO researchers, enthusiasts, and the general public with an interest in mysterious phenomena. Come listen to expert ufologists, government officials, and respected scientists presenting information relating to UFOs, extraterrestrials, crop circles, abductions, cover-ups, and more at the largest UFO conference in the country. The 20th anniversary of the International UFO Congress takes place February 23rd through February 27th. Visit UFOcongress.com for more information, including sponsorship and vendor opportunities. Welcome back to Open Minds Radio. Here now, former official spokesperson for the Mutual UFO Network, your host of Open Minds Radio, Alejandro Rojas. Welcome back. This is Alejandro, and I am here with Leslie Keen. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and I think your book kind of, uh, by its very nature, kind of disproves this concept, but there was a recent book written that the entire UFO phenomena is really a disinformation um, project by the Air Force. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that idea? You mean, um, meaning that every sighting is a result? I, I don't quite follow. But in that the whole uh, idea has been reinforced uh, by the Air Force, and that, yeah, essentially the public has taken on this, this uh, mythology, and uh, now since it's in their mind, that they, this whole UFO thing was really just a, all a disinformation kind of. But then, project. how would you explain the sightings if that was the case? How would you explain the physical data and the, uh, you know? Mm-hmm. That, I think that I mean that's the, I, I haven't read the book and I don't I don't really know what it is you're referring to, but I don't I don't think that um, these some of these best cases that we have and certainly the ones that are brought forward in my book by the actual sources themselves and, and are backed up by multiple witnesses and radar and photographs and government documents and all the things that we have so we know exactly what happened we have lots of detail about it and you have a physical thing there doing certain things i don't really see how that can be explained as air force disinformation when you had something physical that actually happened well, and like you demonstrate, it's international as well. Well, it's absolutely international everywhere around the world. Uh, so I, I don't know if this, if this um, new book is stating that every case was therefore some kind of technology or, I mean, how would, what is the theory about how you would explain all these different cases? Well, I think essentially he's saying that there are misrepresentations and that people, because the, this idea of UFOs and is so popular, that people are prone to um, call something a UFO without carefully determining what it is. Well, I mean, I think that's probably true, and certainly, mm-hmm. I mean, I do make the point in the book, and so have a lot of other people, that 95% of all sightings can be explained, and I'm sure a lot of the ones that, you know, are just what you're saying, that people sort of project the idea of a UFO onto something strange that they see, but that's 95%. There are 5% that absolutely cannot be explained that way. And these are the ones that we're concerned about. I mean, and so I think this gentleman may be making a valid point 
for the cases that we're not concerned about, the ones right. that in fact are explainable or that are something no other than a, a truly unexplainable physical phenomenon, which the problem is we're stuck with those cases. <laughs> right. The, you know, the ones that have been extremely well researched and have m oh, so much documentation that you absolutely cannot explain them any other, you know, that they are a physical phenomenon well documented and unexplained. So it's not to say that his point isn't valid, but I don't think it applies to the the absolute best cases we have that have been officially investigated and documented, such as the ones in the book, such as the Belgian wave or the um, Hudson Valley wave or many other, you know, the Bentwaters case, the Rendlesham Forest incident, um, mm -hmm. any other cases. Right, uh, and that's what gets a little frustrating with the field, and maybe we'll see how, because you've dealt with some skeptics, like James Oberg of MSNBC, uh, the space correspondent, you know, what he wrote about you and your book in that um, – Often these sort of explanations, which don't really explain what your book is even referring to, somehow get adopted by, you know, SETI scientists or, or like James Oberg and repeated when they're not really looking at the details. I think you're right. And what's, you know, what's really interesting to me about what you just said and what James Ober said, they're actually making points sometimes that really aren't even applicable. Right to what it is that they're criticizing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they just sort of throw it out there, and, and, and it's sort of a sloppy thing, and, the, you know, maybe some of the people that are skeptical anyway and don't want to accept this can sort of latch on to it and say, oh, yeah, well, he's discredited it. But there isn't real, there's no real intellectual honesty behind it. That's the thing. Right. I mean, for Albert to say, pilots are not a good, good observers because in the for the cases that uh, where there's a, a need to have a very fast response, a two- or three-second response because of some kind of dangerous threat that a pilot is perceiving, he makes the point that in those situations, pilots can misidentify things. Well, yeah, nobody would disagree with that, but the problem is it has nothing to do with the content of my book, right? which has no cases in it, or the major cases in the book, let's say, that are explored, are not situations where pilots are in the where have two seconds to respond to danger. I mean, mm -hmm. so anyway, he he's uh, presenting points that really don't even apply to the data, and I think it's just the kind of thing that happens, as you've said many times over and over again. Yeah, skeptics that that you know want to just at all costs want to make this subject uh, implausible and want to be able to explain it away, and they will go to great lengths to do that, no matter how implausible, irrational, or dishonest the, uh, the attempts are to do it. I mean, we just see this happening over and over again. I'm, I'm so curious about the motivations of these debunker types. I mean, I really don't know what drives them to behave the way they do, and I'm, I'd, I I'd agree. love to be inside their heads sometime and, and learn a little more about what, what motivates them. Especially someone who, like James Oberg, he writes for MSNBC. I mean, uh, he's a, he's a very major journalists out there and one of the most popular websites and, and news sources out there uh, and he's writing for it and unfortunately often when it comes to this subject they're allowed to not really demonstrate the journalistic um, integrity that they normally would for any other story. Well that's true I think with the UFO subject yeah that's a good point you know because it's such a difficult subject for people to accept all kinds of things go on and all kinds of standards are applied that I guess are not often applied especially in terms of people's lack of willingness to even accept the subject mm -hmm. so you're right I mean not all subjects are treated that way I was um, happy though that that MSNBC did uh, publish though your your retort which I, your rebuttal which often they don't do well, I was really, I have to say, I'm, I'm very thankful to James Oberg for uh, writing the piece that he wrote because it allowed me the opportunity <laughs> right. to write a piece for MSNBC.com, which um, talked a lot about the book and allowed me to present more material about the book. And so it was actually a great opportunity for me. Mm -hmm. I was pleased to address the points that he made. And um, I think that I, you know, really pointed out the, the holes and the problems with what he was saying, and so the whole thing was to my benefit, really. And I'm I'm uh, thankful to him for making giving me that opportunity. Mm -hmm. 
Another thing that was brought back into the public's eye and again became a very popular story uh, because of, well, some of the interviews that you had done was the O'Hare incident in 2006 where um, there was a sighting over the airport. Uh, the story was the largest, most popular story on the Chicago Tribune. And I noticed that, I think it was after you were on the Colbert Report, that it once again became one of their more popular stories. Yeah, I thought that was really amazing, too. I mean, it just shows the power of national television where, it, it, you're right, it came from the Colbert show, and, you know, he made a comment about we We somehow got into a few lines, really. It wasn't that long, but we were mm -hmm. talking about the O'Hare case. And uh, just as a result of that, all these people were going on Google and searching it, and they ended up at the Chicago Tribune website, and it started to get all these hits again on that case, and, and, ended up, and the Tribune actually ended up writing a little piece about it. So it's kind of amazing. That was really amazing to me, and I thought, well, this national television business is pretty powerful when you can generate, you know, a, a comment on, on the, that he, in a, a brief discussion like that, leads to this kind of attention being placed on this case. So that was really, that was really great. Yeah, that was cool to see, uh, and it was also great to see um, Hilkovich, the writer of the story for the Tribune, uh, to also do interviews again on the case and still stick to his guns where he really ran into the same issues that we run into as civilian investigators uh, where uh, official organizations are kind of giving us a runaround and then changing their stories from what their original story was to, to their final conclusions. Yeah, I mean, that's what he ran into when he was looking into the O'Hare case at the beginning. You're right, where the FAA originally wouldn't say anything, and then they, they gave us the explanation that um, what the pilots were seeing were airport lights reflecting off the clouds. That was the first attempt, and, um, and he learned from them from, I mean, soon after that comment was made, it was determined that the airport lights were not even on at the time of the incident because it was too early in the day, you know, but it didn't stop the FAA from throwing that one out. And so right. then they moved on to the famous weather explanation. But, yeah, I mean, I think Hilkovich was kind of amazed by many things about this case that he wasn't used to dealing with because his, you know, as a transportation writer, he just writes more or less fairly straightforward, mundane stories. And when he came in into this one with the, the, also the way the aviation safety aspect was handled, I mean, he was really surprised at the lack of interest that the FAA had in a case involving safety issues. And right. made the comment that, you know, normally the slightest little safety violation, he used the example to me of a, 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 a coffee pot coming loose in the galley, say. Mm -hmm. the kitchen of the airplane, a coffee pot comes loose during the landing of the plane. Even something like that is checked out and investigated by the FAA. Wow. But here you have a, a strange object hovering over the United Airlines terminal, and they're completely uninterested in it. And that really kind of floored him because he was coming in looking at this from the outside. He'd never had any experience with the UFO issue in, in before, like so many of us have. So we weren't so surprised for mm -hmm. those of us who were familiar with the, the government's normal response to this to these sightings, but he was really kind of floored by that because so many of the witnesses were concerned about these safety issues. Right. As, and he was just sort of said, you know, he didn't get why they were so blasé about it or why mm -hmm. they were so disinterested. Why do you think that's the case? Oh, boy, well, that is certainly a complicated <laughs> question. I mean, and I uh -huh. think it goes back to the 50s, really. The origin of it was, was back in the 50s with the... Um, you know, when there were so many sightings and the Air Force was just beginning to kind of grapple with the overwhelming numbers of sightings that were coming in. And then you had the, the CIA Robertson panel convened where they handpicked a bunch of scientists to come together to figure out a way to sort of handle the over the volume of reports that were clogging up their systems. And they were concerned about the Russians taking advantage of this and that's when they came out with this um, recommendation that the UFO subject should be debunked. I mean, they used the word mm -hmm. that it should be debunked in the media and in documentary films and television and advertising and all these things. And I think it just became sort of 
the standardized approach. The Project Blue Book for years was making up, you know, ridiculous explanations for cases that didn't really apply, but they would just wanted to explain them away. And then J. Allen Hynek in the 70s coming out with his own admission that this is, you know, how irresponsible and um, the Blue Book people were and how they didn't, you know, they, I mean, he verified all of this after Blue Book closed in 1970, but the trend was just so in, um, deeply ingrained in the the official approach to the UFO issue and the cultural approach as well, and I just think, you know, there hasn't been enough to really um, happen to break through that. It's become sort of a, a pattern, and, um, you know, and to what extent there is some kind of secret investigation going on, we don't really know, but I'm sure that there are agencies that have inve are still investigating this. So it's a bit of a mystery as to why it goes on. I mean, it helps to look through at the history, I mm -hmm. think. And but, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's just sort of the way we've been doing this since the 50s. Right. And, um, you know, and I'm hoping that the book um, is going to be, be able to use as a tool to try to do something about that and mm -hmm. really uh, get the political establishment to reevaluate it and to just take some small steps towards changing that. Um, Would you say you have a strategy in, in, in hap helping make that happen? Yeah, I mean, is it, you know, a loose strategy. I mean, it's a strategy that's amendable to many different possibilities, but we have proposed in the book um, the idea of, of working towards establishing a simple and small government office, an official focal point for UFO investigations. And again, sort of modeled after the one in France, maybe even smaller scale in terms of the actual staff. But anyway, you know, this is the, the model that we're putting forward in the book, um, mm -hmm. and that this could be set up without a lot of fanfare, without a lot of expense, just kind of quietly become part of the, the huge establishment of the Defense Department or within some government agency to have a small office where some person there is responsible for coordinating investigations into UFO events that happen and networking with other countries, networking with professionals around the country so that if we have another incident like we did at O'Hare, there is somebody in an official capacity that's prepared to properly investigate it. That's what we would like to see change in similar with the way they do it in France. Right. Where, you know, they will go out and and they have access to all the data, which is what's so important. You know, a, a civilian group like MUFON or NARCAP or any of us, individual journalists like myself, with, you know, to get information is, is really a challenge, mm -hmm. as it was for Hilkovich, and you got to go through the Freedom of Information Act. It takes a lot of time. But when you have an actual government official in place, who he can walk into the to O'Hare Airport, and the information is all provided to that person. He doesn't have to wait around. You know, he can get his hands on all the information and can conduct all the interviews necessary. And in an ideal scenario, none of those witnesses at O'Hare should have any reason to be afraid to put their names on the record, which they all were. But right. they wouldn't be if we had this official agency set up. So that's what our, anyway, our strategy is to try to bring about something along those lines. Um, What's so to keep uh, an organization like that from becoming like a blue book or what uh, blue book was alleged to be kind of a, a public facing, um, you know, research organization that uh, didn't have access to everything they should have had access to, uh, on including all of the reports? Yeah, well, I mean, it's true that whether the staffer would have access, to, he's not going to have access to the top secret, you know, mm -hmm. classified reports. I'm, I'm sure of that. But I think the focus is more on making it possible for a proper investigation to be done in the future than it is to try to get a lot of more uh, documents released, although that could be part of the job, too. But um, I think what really, you, you, first of all, you know, the, this is so long since Project Blue Book. I mean, I don't think that there's any reason to assume that we would have the same problems. I think a lot of what we have to do is have a civilian advisory board, and this is what they mm -hmm. do in, in Japan, too, that oversees and works closely with the staff people there and has quarterly meetings and provides expertise and advice and information to the pers people in charge of this agency because they're not going to know a whole lot about UFOs. 
if you have a you know a staffer from the Air Force, let's say, assigned to take this on, as was Nick Pope, for instance, at the Ministry of Defense in the UK. He didn't know anything about the subject when he started. Right. So we propose having a, a board of advisors composed of former military people, top-notch scientists, expert researchers, you know, a very expert group of people that can sort of guide and oversee the organization to make sure that everything is made public and to just make sure that we don't mistake, uh, repeat the mistakes of Project Blue Book. I mean, I think that if something like this were established today, it would really be done with the proper intention. Mm-hmm. And um, there's, you know, it, it's a very different climate now than it was back in the 50s when Blue Book was set up. And, and there were so many reports, and the, the Air Force was overwhelmed and completely baffled by what was going on. And, it, you know, I think we've come a long way since then. We have other agencies around the world that this this office could interact with, and I just, um, you know, I think where there would be enough positive influence on this particular office that it would be, we could avoid those problems. Yeah, well, I like the idea of the civilian oversight, too, or involvement. Uh, We have organizations like the SSE uh, of scientists who are educated in, uh, uh, many of them educated in this field, Uh, and also we have larger organizations like uh, yours and MUFON and uh, to to be watchdogs over this group. Um, so, because I, I think about that a lot, you know, what could we do now to influence that kind of thing? And I think another great thing about what you're doing here is providing information. A lot of people, you know, pound the doors uh, of the White House and tell the politicians, you got to tell us the secrets. But as we know, you know, the politicians don't all have those secrets. No, I would say none of them do. So they I need mean, information. You're absolutely right. There's some kind of, there's sort of this naive assumption, I think, on a lot of people's parts that, oh, there's this cover-up, and, uh, you know, the, if we can just get to the right member of Congress, they know this, and the other one knows this. And, you know, these, these people who are the elected officials are not privy to deep, dark secrets about the UFO and issue, and they're not even concerned about it. I mean, they have their, their focus is on many, many other things. So mm-hmm. I think that's one of the reasons why we don't want to, emphasize in our approach to, to government officials any kind of accusations of covers up or things that happened many decades ago. I mean, these, these our current officials have nothing to do with that, and they're not informed about the deep, dark stuff. So we just need to actually approach them with a positivity and an invitation that they feel inspired to respond to, mm-hmm. which is more along the lines of, hey, America, you're so important, we need your help. And, you know, to appeal to them in, in a positive light um, rather than to be accusing them of having done all these horrible things 60 years ago. I mean, right. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of strategy and a matter of deciding what, which, which, which method is more likely to yield the results that we want. Exactly. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with that because, I mean, right now, obviously, uh, we're not getting very far. And I think if uh, we can educate our leaders on uh these various credible incidents like your book does, uh, then they have more uh, more in their arsenal to become interested in the first place and then to also seek answers or to seek to establish um, a research group uh, desk like you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's true, and I think the book really gives them the absolutely key, irrefutable, documented information uh, that they need about the UFO subject to be serious about it. I think it's it's um, it's all there in this book, and um, it's enough to make it compelling for them to take this on. And I'm just hoping that the book, and that's one reason why I'm so hopeful that lots of people will read it and that it will mm-hmm. do well is because you know the more recognition it gets the more useful it's going to be as a tool you know getting it into the right hands getting these people to become aware of this information and this is information presented in a way that in a way that they can relate to you mm-hmm. know with the right kind of language the right people the right kind of documentation um, it's one thing I've learned over the years is I've learned sort of how to communicate with these people in, in official positions? What, how, what's their language and what can they accept? And I think this book really encapsulates the, the best possible information for them. And I just hope very much that 
people will read it and talk about it and get it out there into the hands of people who are in a position to affect policy and to affect attitudes in the culture. Right. Well, and, you know, I think it could really has the potential to be a tool for that purpose. And I, right. that's my ultimate goal in, in really in writing it. Mm-hmm. And I hope that that happens. Well, I think, you know, uh, it shows that people are reading it because it's a, it was a, on the New York Times bestseller list. And I think anything, most books that uh, hit the New York Times bestseller books is a list, especially one uh, that kind of stands out um, in a particular genre like this one, helps define kind of the paradigm that people uh, and the evolution of how people think of UFOs. And that alone, I think, is extremely significant. So uh, I think you've already succeeded in making a huge difference uh, once again. Well, thanks a lot. I hope you're right, and I, I think you're right. I mean, I've been very, very pleased with what's happened so far, and we've been on the bestseller list for three weeks. And um, Was that I a honestly, surprise? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, as I said, it, it is. It's a huge surprise, but at the same <laughs> time, it's not. It's uh-huh. a very strange perception for me, uh-huh. and I hope you can understand that. I mean, because, you know, when I was writing this book, I was thinking, you know, my God, this is just incredible stuff. And my God, you know, how could people not read this and, and how could they read this and not be like totally right. knocked over by it? Mm-hmm. And so if you follow that thought and that, you know, then you think, well, yeah, of course it's going to be a huge deal when it comes out. And yeah, why wouldn't it be on the best yeah. list? And why wouldn't everybody be amazed at this phenomenal story, you know? And um, so on that level, I'm really not surprised. But yep. on the other hand, I'm also really surprised. (laughs) I think it proves. For obvious reasons. Yeah. um, I think it proves what the numbers show that there, I mean, if 30%, which is some of the most conservative uh, numbers out there of the number of people who believe in UFOs or believe there's something to the subject, Mm -hmm. that's a lot of people. And I think your book proves that those people really are out there and uh, they're just in the closet. Yeah, I agree. And I think those are the people that hopefully buying the book initially, but as I've said, I really wrote it f- intended for the people who don't know anything about UFOs, yeah. who don't necessarily already even have any opinion mm-hmm. about them at all, and who wouldn't even normally buy a book about UFOs. Yeah. I mean, that's really the person, that's why, you know, right. some of this case information might be familiar to a lot of people in MUFON who have studied UFOs for right. a long time. This book was geared towards a person who knows absolutely nothing about them. Mm-hmm. And um, a, an intelligent person who's skeptical, who wouldn't normally be concerned or think about UFOs, who wouldn't normally buy anything on it. So um, I hope that, you know, those are the people. And I know that there are a lot of those people reading the book because I've heard from so many people and lots of people on my Facebook page and my blog, people have written who have for just regular people who were never concerned about this before and have picked up this book. So right. that's so gratifying to me that it's really reaching a whole new audience, which is what I hope well, continues to happen. I am just, you know, so excited about this book. UFOs on the record dot com is a website. Uh, there's even more I, I, I know I would have loved to have talked about. Maybe hopefully we can do this again soon. Uh, but we're out of time now. I am just, you know, thank you. Uh, for what you've done here again I think what you've done in the past has been extremely significant and and here you've done it again I just really get tickled when when people like you um, come forward with these incredible pieces of work and uh, I'm very excited about it so well thank you very much I appreciate that and yeah I would love everyone to go to my website which is ufosontherecord.com and Amazon has a very cheap price on the book right now. So Great. It's on sale on Amazon. That's a good place to get it. Yep. All Thanks right. Thank you, Alejandro. I appreciate the, uh, being with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much for having you on the show. And we'll talk to you soon, hopefully. Okay. Th- take care. Thanks. Next week on Open Minds Radio, we're going to have Robert Vandenbroek. Uh, This is a very controversial case out of Holland, and we're going to have Nancy Talbot on who's investigating this case. Crop circles and strange pictures and strange substances found in these crop circles, all rigorously and scientifically explored by Nancy Talbot. That's next week. It's an exclusive for OpenMinds.tv, so be sure to join us for that. It's going to be a ton of fun. 
uh, really, I think we're going to be the only ones who's ever had this guy on the air. Talk to you then. Open Minds Radio, your UFO news authority. Talk to you next week.